Um, so hello everyone and welcome to our conversation with Dr. Tom Marshburn. Um, my name is Kristen Thompson and I am an assistant professor of physics here at Davidson College. As my area of expertise is astrophysics, it is a vast understatement to say that I'm excited for what is to come in the next hour. I have the distinct honor of introducing our guest and helping to moderate today's event. But before we get started, I would like to offer an overview of our event and some participation guidelines for those who are joining us today. Dr. Marshburn will begin by offering a short presentation describing his current project related to helping astronauts cope with isolation and loneliness on long duration space missions, a topic to which many of us may relate given the current coronavirus pandemic. I know that there will likely be many questions from the audience throughout the talk, so we will reserve much of the hour for questions following the presentation. Questions are certainly encouraged, so please ask if you have them. However, due to the virtual nature of the event, I ask that you submit your questions through the chat feature in Teams. You may type and submit your questions at any time. You don't need to wait until the end of the presentation. Following the conclusion of the talk, I'll moderate the question and answer session and I'll deliver questions to our speaker. And just so you know, if you would like to share this discussion with friends and family, or if you wish to revisit it later, a recording of the full session, as well as a video produced for the Davidson community by Tom and colleagues will be posted to the college website. Throughout the entire presentation, I do ask that you keep your microphones and cameras muted. All right, so now to introduce our guest. NASA astronaut Tom Marshburn has strong ties to Davis, Washington, North Carolina. Born in Statesville, North Carolina, Tom earned a Bachelor of Science degree in physics from Davidson in 1982. He went on to earn a master's in engineering degree from the University of Virginia, a doctorate of medicine from Wake Forest University, and a master's in medical science from the University of Texas Medical Branch. Tom was working with astronauts a decade before he himself received the title. After working in emergency medicine, he was accepted into the inaugural class of NASA UTMB Space Medicine Fellows. He joined NASA in 1994 as a flight surgeon, assigned to space shuttle medical operations into the joint US-Russian space program. From 1994 to 2004, his duties ranged from serving as co-chair of medical operations for the shuttle Mir space program to lead flight surgeon for two missions to the International Space Station and medical operations lead for the space station. In 2004, Tom received his space wings as he was selected as a NASA astronaut. He has completed two missions to the International Space Station logging a total of over 160 days in space, completing four spacewalks for a total of more than 24 hours, orbiting Earth nearly 2,600 times, and traveling over 68.5 million miles in the process. His first space flight was in 2009, aboard Endeavour as a mission specialist for the STS-127 space shuttle mission. During this mission, he lived aboard the ISS for more than two weeks as part of an international crew working to add integral modules to the under construction space station. In 2012 and 13, Tom launched aboard a Soyuz spacecraft for Expedition 3435, his second mission to the ISS. If you walk through the corridors of the Chambers building on the first floor near the president's office, you will see displayed treasured gifts to the college from Tom including a framed Davidson pennant that flew aboard the space shuttle Endeavour to the ISS. His credentials and interests don't stop with medicine and space. He holds private, instrument, aerobatic, and commercial pilot's licenses. He scuba dives, snowboards, plays guitar, enjoys mountain climbing, and in 1980, backpacked the Pacific Crest Trail from Canada to Mexico. And today, we are fortunate to have him here virtually to share with us some of his recent work. Please join me in extending a warm, virtual, but muted welcome to Davidson alumnus and astronaut, Dr. Tom Marshburn. Hey, good morning. Thanks everybody for, thanks Kristen very much uh, for the intro. I'm glad we got things worked out. 
the uh, you know that whole episode if you hadn't tied in yet we didn't have have calm for a while there and um that's one of the biggest problems that happens in space flight and in flying jets and something we have to uh, get very used to dealing with so uh, you got to experience a little taste of what it's like to to do this job here as we uh, got this uh, all worked out um I'm going to I'm going to go ahead and show you a few pictures here. The way this uh, whole talk happened, uh, as I understand, it, I was talking to Mark Johnson and Mar um, Maria. Uh, I know, Kristen, you were involved. Uh, we didn't get to talk to you directly, but we were, began to talk about space flight and uh, how similar it is to what we are experiencing right now. I woke up in the morning and I, I thought, boy, you know, Living here at home is kind of like when I was on the space station because I'm seeing the same walls every day. Um, and I kind of began to adapt back to life in space and realize it was a habit because I've been trained so well. Uh, and that helped me a lot. So we began to talk about what, what are those things that astronauts know about living in isolation that might be helpful to other people. There's various uh, discussions about this on the internet. I wanted to speak to uh, Davidson directly, and so we made a video, myself and some colleagues, uh, they were very gracious to throw in their, their comments. And so that'll, I think that's on a website you can watch afterwards, so I won't go into too much detail with that. But it talks about um, uh, what are some good habits for people that are living in isolation. I'm gonna show you, I know I just have a few minutes because I really do uh, want to get to uh, questions. And what I'm doing right now is I'm setting up a slideshow that's going to be very short, but just to give you an idea to kind of gauge everyone's sensibility as to what we're talking about here when we talk about astronauts living in isolation. So we're going to leave the Earth <clears throat> Earth on a rocket. It only takes us about eight and a half minutes to get up into space. It's incredibly exciting. Your family was there. Uh, it's the, the pinnacle of your career. And then suddenly the engines cut off and everything's very quiet and everything's floating around you. I had a pin that began to just kind of levitate in front of me and rotate around. I felt my blood rushing to my head. <clears throat> and we left the earth to go to that place. You see it arcing across the sky. You can see the space station at just the right times. There are apps to find out when it passes overhead. But it's traveling about five miles every second. Uh, that comes to about 17,500 miles an hour for that orbit, which is 250 to 300 miles up. When it's passing overhead, it seems it's fairly close, uh, but it is incredibly separated from us in terms of energy. There is no way any of us could just fly up there uh, as we normally do and touch it or be touched by someone from there. Otherwise, it would all explode because of the energy difference between that space station and the Earth. What it requires to get back to Earth <clears throat> is a big rocket to slow us down so we can fall back down to Earth. When I got to the space station, it was about two and a half days after we launched. Now we can get there in about uh, eight hours. <clears throat> but this is what it looks like as you approach it. It's absolutely beautiful. A little bit daunting, though, when you look at all those the Tinker Toy parts that look like little uh, tuna cans and beer cans, <clears throat> they're all stuck together. That is the living quarters. All the rest is the truss and the solar arrays that support an enormous power station that enables us to do the science and live and work on the space station. Biggest power station ever, ever made by humans that's flying in space. <clears throat> We'd love to talk about some of that science if, if you're interested. However, you, we approach that and as you approach it, you realize, you know, I'm going to be living here for the next half of a year to a year and a little bit daunting to think about that. Here's the view of the station and the Earth from the inside of one of the windows of the space station. We do get that uh, gorgeous view of the Earth. I was always fascinated by the beauty of just seeing the technical achievement of the space station and admiring the audacity of people who ever thought we could ever do such a thing. But off to the right, you see some black blackness of space, which uh, for me really grabbed my soul. It was a very intense experience to see that. It's a three-dimensional deep blackness. Um, it's not like a surface that's painted black. Uh, I was reading a little bit and uh, as a, I, I guess it's an aspect of my liberal arts education, which I value very much from Davidson. But uh, Nietzsche said, I looked into the abyss and the abyss looked back at me. That's kind of the feeling I got when I was looking into the blackness of space. 
So who are you living with is very important. We get to, here's the current astronaut core. It's quite small, about the size that it was during the Gemini program. Uh, all uh, interested, motivated people who are, uh, have, <clears throat> most of them have master's to PhD level education, all in their 30s or 40s, or early 50s. Wide, uh, uh, really good diversity, certainly in terms of the international partnerships or lots of different languages. Um, so that's, uh, it's very important for us to be able to congregate together and learn how to work together with that group. Uh, this is me talking to the family. This is the only, my family, this is my only connection to the ground through a laptop, much like we're doing right now. But the view is great. Uh, I was able to go out and do a spacewalk, but spacewalks are very rare. I've done four uh, in my 15 years as an astronaut. I've only done four spacewalks. Totals about uh, 24 hours of my life that I've had a chance to do this. So while it's a, a pinnacle of a flight, it by no means uh, defines what the tempo of the flight is like. Most of it is, this is Dr. Tracy Dyson looking out the window, beautiful window on the space station. Um, we'll have about maybe 45 minutes a day at most of relaxation time to where we have an opportunity to go look out the window, which is what astronauts love to do more than anything else. There, so about the video uh, that we've got going that I believe is posted. See, I'm gonna get my face back here. There we go. Uh, the, the basic principles of the video are how to work as a team, uh, how uh, very importantly, how to be a team member as much as how to be a leader. And in particular, how to take care of ourselves in isolation so that we can be an effective member of a team. I won't go into the details of the uh, <clears throat> video. Um, I will say that many of the people that present the video, there's uh, six of us, we're all physicians. We all happen to be meeting together and talking together uh, during the quarantine period when, and they all offered to contribute. Uh, about half of them are military. There was one woman physician that's currently active in the astronaut office but she also has privileges at a hospital. And while we were all looking forward to her perspective, she had to pull out, could not contribute because she was actually saving lives uh, in the ICU. So that's the only reason why she's not in that video. But the, the basic tenets are how to take care of yourself, how to be a good team member, how to be a good leader if you are called to do so. And more, very importantly, how to be a good follower. And what are the aspects of someone who is a follower? A leader doesn't mean much if, if no one's following. So uh, some of the basic ideas that came from that are simply that uh, while taking care of yourself is very important, it is not a selfish act. It is um, uh, one that actually ends up supporting the whole team. Following again is and being a, a strong follower is probably the most important aspect of a team. And that a leader comes to their position. Certainly they have a technical competence, but they have to have uh, an enormous amount of um, humility as well, recognizing that while no one is good at everything, everyone is good at something and being able to pull that out from each team member. I just wanna tell one quick story and then I'll, I'll be done with my presentation, but it was one of the best moments in my career um, of observing as a flight surgeon, observing astronauts and then being able to work with them shoulder to shoulder. We had a simulation one day and it was a last minute, the, the prime crew that was going to do the simulation with 50 flight control team members and instructors watching, the crew had to, had to cancel. So they brought us in together to fill the slot so at least everyone else could get some training. The commander and my crew, myself and five others, we had two minutes. We showed up, we had two minutes before the sim was to start. The commander was a Marine. And I thought what he said was, was just wonderful, encapsulated in those few minutes. We'd never worked together as a team before, although we knew each other's faces. And he said, okay, we have two minutes. I'm going to make a mistake. You are gonna make a mistake. And I'm gonna give you about a half a second to get over it and then get back with the team. We're gonna do great, let's go. That was all he said. And we had one of the best sims I've ever had. Because that encapsulated so much of recognizing mistakes happen because we all make them and yet recognizing that everybody not only could, but had to contribute something to make us successful. So I, I would like to, before we leave after the questions, I had a few more things to say if, if you don't mind, but that was all, I, I don't wanna take up too much more time. I'd, I'd love to get to the questions if uh, 
people have some if you have a list there. Great, yes, thank you very much, um, Tom, for that. And um, looks like some questions are coming in slowly, um, but maybe I'll just start with a question or two while um, others can think of some questions and um, type them there in that chat window for us. So again, if you do have questions, we would love to have them, so um, please ask. Um, so maybe I'll just start with a question, um, thinking about long duration space missions. Right when when I think of a long duration space space mission, my mind pretty quickly goes to Scott Kelly, who spent nearly one year straight consecutively aboard the International Space Station in 2015 and 2016. And just yesterday, I read his article in the New York Times in which he offered advice to us regarding dealing with isolation in the midst of this COVID-19 pandemic. And in the article, he talked about how much he missed the ability to simply go outside and experience nature and how he began to crave nature so much that his crewmates started playing recordings of earth sounds for him, sounds of like birds and trees rustling and even swarms of mosquitoes buzzing by. From your experience, how long does it take to really start missing some of those, those things that maybe we take for granted here on earth? In my experience, my, my uh, shuttle flight was 16 days, and I, I didn't get to that point then. Certainly within three months, you begin to experience that. Part of it, I think, is the anticipation of when you're going to come home. Uh, Scott uh, had a daunting uh, plan ahead of him that he knew he was going to be up there for almost a year. He's just a couple days short of a year. And that must have been uh, mentally a, a difficult thing at first. So I would say if... <clears throat> Excuse me. I would say three months is typically when people really feel like they've made the transition. Your body adapts uh, in the long term in about six weeks once you've arrived. You think you're adapted and then six weeks later you go, oh, okay, now I'm in my element. Now all of my internal organs are all working the way they should. I'm pretty good at what I do. I'm, I'm not losing stuff all the time. I'm not flo floating off accidentally and uh, uh, bumping into things anymore. And that takes about six weeks. So that's what I would give it. Um, Scott did say one thing to me when he came back and I asked him, what was it like? And he said, well, you know, if I ever in the future am talking to a doctor who tells me, Scott, you've only got a year to live, I'm going to say, that's great because a year is a really, really long time. <laughs> and so uh, I, kudos to him. I, and I have to add, Christina Cook just came back. She's just shy of his record. Um, and she did not know she was going to be doing that long of a mission until right before she launched. So uh, if you haven't followed her at all, uh, she's in the social media and she's got a lot of good things to say about it as well. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I see some questions coming in. I'll ask one more and then I'll um, look at the message board here. Um, you've made a couple trips to the International Space Station. And while there, you were still able to be in contact with people on Earth via video conferencing. Mm -hmm. For example, I was looking through the records and seven years ago yesterday, on April 22nd, 2013, is when you did the live video chat with Davidson College, with our students and with oh, our really? staff. So I thought that was really interesting that we missed it by a day to yeah. have two video conferences with you. Um, but seven years ago yesterday, you were gracious enough to do that with us. Um, do opportunities to chat with those of us on Earth help with the loneliness and feeling of isolation? Or do you feel even more alone and more isolated after you hang up the phone and disconnect? Does that feeling last? Uh, that's a great question. No one's ever asked that before. And I would say it depends on the content of the communication. Um, 99.9% .9 of it is a huge morale boost. As a matter of fact, I never felt lonely on the space station, even though we, we uh, our small crew felt alone. And I say that because as you're working in the laboratory, we were talking to uh, scientists from all around the world. The Russians are talking to, to their colleagues on the ground, and you could hear this buzz of voices. It felt like it was just a beehive of activity all the time. The uh, as, as a matter of fact, when you wake up in the morning, you don't see sunrise you don't uh, the newspaper doesn't arrive or or it's, it's kind of hard to do your normal routine uh in the morning and yet 
I could tell morning was happening as voices started to grow all around me through the speakers and then everyone began to talk again. And if it was quiet, I knew I felt like it was late at night or way early in the morning. Overall, a huge boost. I was able to talk to my family every single day. Uh, we had a little, I had through the laptop, through bouncing off a satellite, directly through um, ground antennas and then into my wife's cell phone, if you can believe that. Now we would get cut off, the satellites would go away from each other and we had to develop a technique for, for talking. And that is to say something, say a few sentences and wait because there's a little time delay. And then my wife would say something and, and not ex expect to be able to say goodbye. The, the, we just get cut off. So don't be disappointed by that. The uh, one thing that did happen, um, and I believe it had happened, uh, let's see, soon after um, our conversation, uh, my mother passed away. It was not a big surprise uh, because she was ill anyway, but no one can ever be prepared for that. And so that was one moment when, given the content of that information, I did feel quite alone, as you can imagine, for a while. Um, the ground control team did a great job, uh, both relaying the information to me and, uh, and supporting me through that. But so it kind of depends on what the content of the communication is. Great, thank you so much, Tom. Um, I'd like to turn to the message board and um, read off a few questions from our from our uh, viewers. Um, so there's a question here from Casey, and she says, for someone who aspires to be an astronaut someday, how do you stay patient, but also driven in continuing your education toward this goal? And so it, how do you do what and continue to stay driven? How do you, how do you stay patient? But patient. Also oh, yeah. Boy, what and isn't that the biggest challenge of all for any big goal that people have, particularly something that uh, not everything is up to you. Right? I, I know that uh, all of you are working hard. You're all smart you, for those things that you can control. You're probably going to do extremely well at them. But there are other factors that we can't control at all. Uh, maybe I was missing a kidney. I never knew it. And, and I wouldn't been disqualified. A good friend of mine that happened to him. He was with me in, in our uh, during our physicals during selection for the astronaut program. So I um, believe me, I didn't think I would ever become an astronaut and I did not have a extremely well planned out. I planned as much as I could, but uh, uh, not an extremely detailed plan simply because every every plan I had fell apart uh, to uh, having a chance to work at NASA and become an astronaut. So I had to keep on moving it. Uh, moving my plan and adjusting to whatever circumstances allowed. I think it's an extremely hard thing to do, but it's very exciting when you pull it off, realizing that no matter what the outcome is, whatever your goal is, be an astronaut or whatever, <clears throat> whatever the outcome is, there's a lot of good that can, can come from that. If you've, uh, for instance, I studied hard for medical school, had it happened that I didn't get in, well, I had that lesson learned to uh, springboard off of, and I had that uh, knowledge base that I had gained and I could have gone into something else. I did have to do that a number of times. I always wanted to work at JPL. I thought, boy, that'd be a great way to get to NASA work through JPL. Didn't work out. I ended up somewhere else, <clears throat> excuse me, somewhere else. I ended up at the NIH. So always saying that didn't work. So what else can I do to keep pressing on? Um, your your passion for whatever it is you want to do is going to keep continue to motivate you. So what you got to do is make sure you handle the disappointment, which is inevitable. As a matter of fact, NASA likes it when people uh, come to them applying to be an astronaut and they've experienced disappointment and handle it, know what to do and recover from it. So <clears throat> think of the uh, departures from the uh, trying to achieve your goal as actually being stepping stones to success. A bit of a cliche, but very true. And uh, uh, opportunity really to, uh, to um, show what you can do. I don't know if that answers your question, but walking that tightrope between reality and passion is a really hard one to do. Um, and if you figure it all out, please, please let me know. And me too. Yeah. <laughs> uh, another question um, was submitted by Bruna. And the uh, question is, what personal belongings are you allowed to bring into space? And if you're only allowed a limited amount, were there any particular items that you brought that gave you comfort? That's a uh, good question. Uh, yeah, you're allowed to bring some things. As a matter of fact, you are allowed to bring 1.5 kilograms. 
of things with you. Other than that, it is just your body that goes up. It's even NASA issued or government issued underwear that you're wearing all the way up. Although I had my wedding ring on my finger. That's it. So items for, for other people so I could photograph them and bring them back and give them to folks. One of those items is, is uh, in the first floor of the Chambers building. That uh, was the majority of the things I brought up. Most of the things I brought up that I thought I'd want, I didn't end up using. I, I like uh, word games. I brought a little travel Scrabble uh, game, just not enough time to play it. I was too engrossed in all the work that was going on in the station. I brought a couple of books, small books, John Grisham's Skipping Christmas, because I was going to miss Christmas that year, at least uh, on the earth. Uh, and th those provided uh, some enjoyment. But for me, the greatest comfort besides uh, looking out the window and talking to my family was just continuing to work. I'm one of those kind of people that likes to tinker in the garage, you know, on an off day. So that's what I would do. And I had the opportunity to, to, they let me continue to do some science experiments with ultrasound. I was ultrasounding myself, trying to look for things that no one had ever seen before, trying to understand how the body works in zero gravity. Um, so my greatest comfort with it was that. And then of course, being able to talk to my family and, uh, to be able to, um, uh, look out the window. Uh, exercise is a big deal up there too. And I, I hurt my knee once, so I couldn't uh, do some of the really huge uh, resistive exercise we're uh, able to do and have to do on the station for about two weeks. And I realized how much exercise meant to me when it was taken away for two weeks as my knee recovered. Um, so I didn't realize it, but exercise was a huge comfort to me as well. Great, thank you so much. We have a question from Emily. Can you talk about some of the most memorable medical situations you've treated while in space? And maybe you've mentioned one there with a knee injury. Yeah, yeah, that uh, could have been a big deal. What's happened is there have been some big deals that have happened in space. And as a physician, I can't talk about individuals, but I can certainly tell you, you know, we've had a long enough history. I can tell you the kind of stuff that have happened that's happened. I can say that fortunately, as a physician, I, uh, I was the first responder, if you will, the, the person most responsible for anything that came up. Um, I had a, uh, uh, not me personally, but one of my crewmates had a uh, crown come off. So I had to do some dental work. That was probably the biggest thing, worst thing, fortunately, that happened to me. I did have a crew member with some abdominal pain, which is kind of kind of scary up there when you think, what are all the possibilities? But I was able to use my background to to at least uh, calm everybody down, the ground down, say, I, I think this is not a big deal, and it, and it wasn't. So, uh, but things, bad things have happened up there. Kidney stones have happened. Uh, depression <clears throat> has occurred, particularly in the Russian program. <clears throat> there have been other dental problems. The teeth are, and the eyes are two very sensitive uh, areas of the human body, the hands as well. Uh, some uh, skin infections have happened that have almost uh, brought people home before. Uh, a couple of cardiac arrhythmias as well in the in spacecraft history or space flight history. Um, that has happened as well. That's that caused, uh, in one case, actually caused a crew to come back home. Um, but those are the main things that have happened. We're finding out all kinds of stuff all the time. It's been discovered that astronauts actually have increased pressure in their head, probably, and in their eyes as well, which affects our vision. Uh, and that has happened to for people who have had uh, permanent changes in their vision, uh, not good changes. Not good changes. And, uh, uh, trying, trying to deal with that, that as well. Us. So that is the, uh, I, I could give you the whole long list of things that have happened. Fortunately, I did not have to deal with anything too, too drastic. Great. That's great news. From <laughs> Andrea, there's lots of physics majors tuned in. Could you tell us what your favorite physics class was at Davidson? My favorite physics class. For me to answer that, you'd have to know a little bit about me. And I'll just say that I've always been attracted to what scares me the most. So it would be somewhere <laughs> somewhere between uh, e and m and quantum, uh, both of them extremely challenging. Now, mechanics, certainly challenging. I just felt like I had a feel for it more than the others, which is probably true of all of us or most of us. And so a little less formal thinking. I mean, I could imagine that mass on a spring. I had a hard time figuring out a, a wave function and forming a picture in my mind. But um, I've given talks before where I, I talk about 
why I did what I did flying and climbing and all that. And I've always had, when I was little, I had fear of the outdoors, fear of being alone, fear of, uh, of um, heights. And I found out I've got that personality disorder or whatever it is that makes somebody be attracted to whatever scares them. So I look back on E&M and quantum as being some of my best memories. I think also scariest for many people. Yeah. <laughs> Um, a question from Mark. He asks, or he says, uh, next month, NASA is scheduled to launch astronauts from U.S. soil for the first time in nearly a decade. Yeah. Since your retirement of the, or since the retirement of the space shuttles in 2011, we've been hitching a ride with the Russians. In your opinion, have we lost some of the public's sense of connection with the need of space exploration? The uh, have we lost sense of connection? I would say it's it's hard to maintain the connection at all times. We certainly during in the 60s um, had a great connection because I think they, everyone in the country was looking at this as our survival. Can we beat the Russians? Not to mention uh, just the first forays into space were incredibly exciting. And so um, it's, it's just a matter of grabbing the, the public's attention. Who knows what it's going to be? I'm reminded of when the shuttle retired and they were starting to put the shuttles on trucks as they, and they had to mow down telephone poles. They had to move, uh, practically move buildings and walls to get these huge space shuttles through the streets and into the museums where they now reside. I'll never forget the response of the public to that, people in tears, actually. And so I, that said to me that there's a, still a huge uh, connection of the public we're always told that both um, sides of um, Congress are, uh, all of Congress is still very much behind the space program. Um, so certainly though, being able to launch is, uh, right now it's May 27th is launch date. Being able to launch out of Florida again is going to be a very huge deal. And uh, certainly we're expecting a, a, a revival of, of interest. There should be another one that follows soon after that. There will, however, just so you know, continue to be Soyuz flights uh, from Russia out of Kazakhstan. We'll continue to train people to fly in the Soyuz. We have a uh, kind of a, a shared uh, survival that depends on Americans on Russian vehicles and Russians on U.S. vehicles. We all depend on each other to keep that space station going. And so we're, we're going to continue the partnership, certainly. Uh, to include Americans on Soyuz is here for the foreseeable future for certainly for the next several years. Great. Um, I think that actually answered a few of the questions that I'm seeing coming through in the mes message board. So I think you knocked out a few questions with <laughs> with that response um, from Caroline. How would you describe the type of community aboard the International Space Station? Was your experience connecting with people from all different cultures and backgrounds all working toward the same goal? Connecting with people um, was easy to do in the sense that um, the international partners, the changes in cultures and what they eat and, uh, and language differences ad actually adds uh, an enormous amount of um, energy to the crew. Uh, plenty of opportunities for humor and for being able to feel good about connecting with each other. The biggest communication problems actually were between um, to Americans speaking English, if you can believe that. That's, uh, I, I guess we uh, don't work too hard when we are able to speak the same language, work too hard on all the other external cues necessarily, whereas with uh, someone who doesn't uh, speak English as a native language or a Russian will treat me because Russian's not my native language, will slow down, be precise, be kind and patient. <laughs> All those good things that happen when you're talking to someone in a different language. So overall, uh, very positive. If an emergency happens, the official language is English. Sure enough, though, people are going to revert to their uh, native language. And we have ways we train that. We have ways of dealing with that if that were to happen. But uh, overall, the language is a uh, is a wonderful aspect. So is food. You know, food is one of the biggest things, even more than talking to each other. Great. From Caroline, how do you care for your physical and mental health when you have a shared space? So, uh, and they're going to talk about that in that video a little bit. 
uh, first of all, protect your own space, develop your own space, and uh, make sure you can you got your own little personal bubble, which means you got to respect other space. And in space, it's not a and maybe for some of you at home, um, privacy is not something that you are can have all the times, but it's something that people can give you. And in definitely in space, people have to give you privacy and respect that. Um, so that's uh, one of the one of the biggest things about uh, keeping keeping your private space. The uh, uh, everybody has the thing that they love to do that makes them happy. Uh, although we all overlap in exercise and looking out the window and having a good day at work, feeling like we accomplished something. Those are the things that I think were uh, both uh, mental, mental and physical well-being were the most important things. And after that, at least in terms of the mental well-being, everybody's got their own own deal. I would. Uh, you know, tinker around in a laboratory somewhere. I talked to my family. Some people were, I was up there with Chris Hadfield who loved outreach. He was hugely motivated to constantly be tweeting and making videos for his uh, fellow countrymen in Canada. Uh, that was what made his, made his day each day. So it, it varies. Let's bring it back to Davidson a little bit. We have a question from Michelle. She asks, what is your favorite memory as a Davidson student? Wow, a lot of good ones there. So I've got to think for a little bit. Um, certainly, boy, with each year, sophomore year is kind of tough. So there's not a lot of, <laughs> I think everybody, I don't know if you still call it the sophomore slump or not. Uh, that's just a it's funny human nature thing. Uh, arriving at Davidson, meeting people for the first time, but um, much like space flight, it's the human interactions, isn't it? It's the uh, the moments that you have that that incredible conversation you had with the professor uh, out in the quad or, or sipping coffee or uh, talking to some some friends uh, that are going to end up being your lifelong friends. That to me, that ends up being uh, always what we look back to. When I look back on my space flights, it's shoulder to shoulder with somebody else looking out the window and talking about what we're seeing. That is what I remember the most and treasure the most. So those moments, um, I'd love to give you, well, I, okay, well, I'll give you one uh, specific thing. Uh, I was a physics major doing our senior project. I've been working with Dr. White, uh, who's no longer with us, <clears throat> but he was my senior advisor. And we'd been working for weeks on trying to be able to uh, make a diffraction grading out of uh, ultrasound waves in a, in a water bath. In the moment, working in the summertime in the basement of uh, what was then the, the physics building, and suddenly seeing a diffraction grating in this dark room appear on the wall everything worked out just perfectly and i went i can't believe it it's you know in one flash everything seemed to work so i ran upstairs and got dr white and he came down he was thrilled um, that was that was a unique and and fun moment for sure hmm. sounds fun um, i know some of my students are here so i'd like to ask a question maybe on their behalf um, maybe this will get their gears going a little bit. But in my first year writing course, we've been talking about the importance of planetary protection, and which is the principle of preventing biological contamination of other worlds. Um, we discussed the importance of preventing both forward contamination of other worlds and backward contamination of Earth. And I recently saw in the news that it's been reported that a Russian space official who was present for the recent Soyuz launch um, on April 9th has tested positive for coronavirus. But I imagine that both NASA and the Russian Space Agency has strict guidelines in place um, for both the flight crew and those involved with mission operations. Can you speak to some of the guidelines that you've experienced and kind of the pre-flight testing that you may have incurred in preparation for launch? Is yeah, really the um, you're you're right. I mean, it's, uh, NASA does watch that very closely, and and whatever rules we had before are greatly uh, increased <clears throat> in the current environment. You you might not be surprised at what they we actually test us with. I mean, they do swabs, nasal, oral, skin, uh, blood, just to see if we've got anything going on. But they've been uh, monitoring that on astronauts uh, throughout our career, trying to catch anything early if anything happens. What's sort of unique is once we're in quarantine. The, uh, the biggest danger to us, as long as people are, are not lying about their symptoms, the biggest danger to us from an infectious disease standpoint is our kids. 
because they go to schools and they're uh, these are vectors of all these viruses and they don't have any symptoms until much later. So one of the difficult things about being in quarantine is they'll restrict access to your smaller children and somewhat arbitrary cut off 12 years of age or younger. Um, and, and of course, uh, they've, uh, in Russia, we only talk to people through a glass wall. We're allowed primary contact, they call it, uh, being able to touch someone with people that have been screened and are the closest family members or instructors that have to work with us very directly. So that is, uh, with the COVID-19 situation, that has gotten even more so. Quarantine is longer and the restrictions are tighter on who can come in and actually converse with the crew and <clears throat> work directly with them, get within their, their space. Um, so that's uh, probably the biggest thing. It's, it's uh, greatly limited who can go to a launch. I know that Chris Cassidy, who launched just a few weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago, he, uh, his wife couldn't go. They couldn't work it out, couldn't get her out there. First time, I think, ever that somebody uh, had a partner who couldn't be there to be, uh, to be present at the time of a launch. And I think we can expect a little bit more of that as time goes on. This crew that's going to launch here in just a couple of weeks, end of May, uh, or in about a month, they are, I mean, it's going to be a huge event, of course. There's probably going to be a NASA administrator there. I, their uh, partners are going to be able to be there to see them off. But I'm not going to be allowed to go. There's going to be a lot of people not allowed to go. There won't be huge crowds on the shoreline uh, unless they're, Further, much further away, and they're probably having to keep their distance as well. Uh, so, so times are going to have changed for this for sure. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a question. I believe this is from Mallory. It says, when you return to Earth after long duration, how much trouble does your body have adjusting to gravity? A lot. It has a lot of trouble, but all the trouble seems to be front loaded right when you come home. I worked out hard on the space station. I came back with more body mass and more lean percentage than when I left because the, the exercise and the nutrition is, is that good as it has to be in space. Otherwise, we'd waste away in zero G and kind of come back like jellyfish. So I felt very strong. I could stand up, but my vestibular system was way out of whack. That took uh, several days. I could walk a straight line, but I couldn't move my head, for instance. I was a little bit dehydrated. That's normal. That's uh, the space adapted. Normal is to be relatively dehydrated. So I had to get an IV, get some fluids. I felt good. But as soon as I moved my head, I wanted to get sick and the earth and the horizon were flopping around. What takes the longest, though, uh, well, you have to get back into shape. We have a space flight induced anemia, and that takes a while to get um, back as well. So it, you can't get to your aerobic capacity in, until several months after you get back. But once all that's solved, I think mentally it's what takes the longest to get back. Um, my wife would tell you that it took six months before I quit just walking out, take out the garbage and staring at the night sky and kind of, you know, <laughs> mentally getting back up there somewhat. So it could take about six months before you're totally reconnected with everybody, everybody back home. There are a lot of funny stories about uh, people doing things like uh, leaving a cup up in the air and letting go of it because for the last six months it would just stay there. But, you know, a lot of broken dishes perhaps around the house. That didn't happen to me. It came really close to that happening to me. And um, or walking around a, a corner in a hallway and just I don't know why but your body just goes way off and you collide off the, the wall to the side there. Uh, so, but there, we've, we pretty much understand that after about two weeks, that at least is going to go away and we'll, we'll look, look for all intents and purposes, like a normal human being after about two weeks when we get back. Great. Perhaps this is a great follow-up question from Kevin. Have space missions become more interdis interdisciplinary? For example, are psychologists involved in space missions? Yes, they have. And Yes, there's been the long duration aspect of it that I think, while, while they, psychologists, psychiatrists, have always been important, particularly in selection of astronauts and perhaps in the construction of a crew and the personalities that go into a crew, because they do make input into that, helping astronauts, enabling astronauts through um, their long duration flights, they've gained a lot more of, I don't know if credence, I mean, they, they always had the credence, but a lot more influence in the day to day activities. Uh, and the construction of the schedules. Uh, every two weeks, you actually have a sit down while you're in space, you have a sit down with your uh, video conference with your uh, psychiatrist and your psychologist. You have one of each of those. 
uh, up there. And so, uh, yeah, there's, you know, that hard kind of test pilot mentality of the 60s has given way a bit to allow the softer sciences, if it's a bad phrase, but still, uh, they'll say it that way, realizing how important that is to um, really the success of the mission. Um, and uh, at, at times a mission could end based on someone's, uh, if they had not in a good psychological or psychiatric state. So uh, those, those things that have uh, gained importance as we realize how much it's needed for long duration flights and will be even more so going to Mars. There's a lot of reasons for that. Hey, Tom, this is Mark. It looks like yeah, Kristen's uh, video froze, so I'm going to, uh, okay. until she gets back, I'll just jump in real quick. So I thought she was just is, riveted with what I was saying. but I guess <laughs> As we all are. Um, so on the space station, if, I'm, if I remember this correctly, at any given moment, a small asteroid, the size of a pebble, the size of a golf ball, could puncture the hull. And I don't know if folks realize, I mean, that's, that's a life or death moment. Um, how do you prepare for that? What's the, what's the risk of that? Well, the risk is, that's probably one of the greatest risks we have up there of something that could be just completely mission ending and uh, <clears throat> end, end the station, if you will. So we train, there's three things we train for, a fire in, on the inside of the space station, a toxic atmosphere, something is released, and the rapid depress from what you just described. So we're very well aware of it. it is the thing that we train the most of anything else. So we have uh, an immediate response that we are to perform. Somewhat complicated if we have time to try to figure out where the hole is. As a matter of closing hatches, uh, keeping in mind that every time you close a hatch that you may have just closed off yourself on the side of the hole and you've decreased the amount of volume you have to uh, or to be able to feed that leak out of the station. So all of that comes together to a um, fairly complex but well rehearsed uh, choreography of events while we try to protect ourselves, but also try to figure out where the hole is. Do things do hit the station? Uh, it's been didn't happen to me, but one time the station flew through the uh, a meteor shower. You know, I guess which is a tale of an ancient comet, and you could hear the little tick 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 as we as it uh, collided at uh, you know whatever uh, Mach 25 with these little tiny uh, grains as it passed through there. So it's always present in our minds uh, that it could happen. What they'll do actually in a sim, we, they get us all together with our Russian colleagues so they can pull out any kind of uh, language difficulties. And we'll be doing a sim together. Somebody gets a big hammer and hits the outside of the simulator. It's made of aluminum. We hear a bang and then the alarms go off and they can't recreate the pressure drop in the ears, but uh, they, they can do a good job of getting your adrenaline going. All right, I'm back. I'm sorry I got disconnected there for some reason for a moment. Um, but we do have a question from Hannah. What inspired you to diversify in the fields of both medicine and engineering? I uh, was motivated by working for this space program. I was 13 when I figured out that's what I, I it kind of chose me actually. I, I um, developed a passion for it. I can't even explain. So I, I, my first track was to get better at math and science and uh, didn't have a technical degree and I did physics at Davidson. So the next logical step was to get a graduate degree. I did want to go to liberal arts, but I wanted uh, an engineering background as well. So I went to UVA to get a graduate degree. During that time though, I had some friends that are in medical school. I got a couple of doctors in my family and I thought, you know, I'm really attracted to that. I think I'd be better at that than in engineering. So uh, I applied to uh, medical school. All of that sort of was related to being on that path to maybe being able to work for NASA someday. <clears throat> but I will admit that medicine was quite a detour simply because I fell in love with it and I completely forgot all my space aspirations while I was in medical school. So, but that's why I, I diversified in that way. I did study some astronauts bios and realized and, and it is true, um, they do want people who are technically very good at what they do, but diversity in your education and interest is extremely important. If anybody's thinking about applying to be an astronaut, I encourage you to do so. I think the applications are open right now. Um, even if you if it's early on, go ahead, <clears throat> go ahead and get your name in there. And so they kind of get used to seeing your name pop up. <clears throat> 
and uh, oh, wide ranging background, professional uh, background is, is of benefit as well. Plus, I'm just I have professional ADD. I think I just I'm a very curious person. <laughs> Luca would like to know what foreign languages did you study during training? Uh, Russian. Russian is is hard enough. You know, they say it, Russian's really not too hard to learn. It's only the first decade that's uh, difficult. So I uh, had to spend all my time that I could, could devote to language training to Russian. So we have uh, language teachers um, there to specifically to help us get better at Russian. I'll spend uh, an hour and a half to three hours a week speaking Russian. Uh, I'm not fluent, but I'm conversational now. Um, so that's and so really Russian. I've at Davidson as a physics major, German and Spanish as well. But but Russian is really the one right now, at least, and will be for the foreseeable future. Uh, one of the main goals of uh, NASA to get their astronauts proficient. Tim asks, can you describe any energy considerations related to life on the space station? For example, is there a need for energy conservation while on board? Interesting, because water conservation, yes, energy conservation only up to a point. And I say that because those solar arrays are incredibly efficient. As a matter of fact, there are electronic boxes on the outside that shunt the, uh, uh, the current coming from those solar arrays right back to the solar array so we don't over, uh, uh, overpower the station. We have uh, the cooling system can only handle so much. Now, having said that, the upper limit, the 120 volts that we do get uh, to supply all of our work, we were extremely power limited, power limited once the uh, electrical supply is there. Uh, and that is always a question for whatever we're working with, how much power is it going to draw when you plug something in? If a scientist or a, a company or a group or university wants to put an experiment on the station, power considerations are one of those things. The amount of power that they can uh, extract out of the space station. But it's it's uh, incredibly efficient. The uh, As a matter of fact, you may have heard of the alpha magnetic spectrometer. Or it's a particle detector sitting on the outside of the space station. That's the only place it could possibly exist because it draws so much power and needs all those solar arrays. So that's a big power draw up there. But what it's looking for, uh, you know, the origin of the universe and then source of uh, dark matter. So it's, it's kind of a cool thing. Ian asks, did you experience the overview effect when you looked back at Earth from space? The what? Uh, he refers to it as the overview effect. Um, so I believe that's some sort of a cognitive shift that some astronauts report, report during space flight as they look back at Earth. And uh, I'd have to spell that out because I, I don't know what that effect is. I can tell you what the effect is for most people. The herb the herb of you. Okay. I think he's referring to the overview effect, Tom, uh, of just seeing ah. Earth, looking back at Earth for the first time from space. I see. Thank you, John. Yeah, um, that is uh, overwhelming. That actually takes uh, a while to process. You, you At first, you're just stunned by what you see. It's so much more detailed and colorful and beautiful and bright than what we see in pictures and video. <clears throat> and I'm having to think about it because, again, all that information, trying to process it, I'll spend the rest of my life trying to describe it. There's certain aspects of it. Certainly, astronauts, you've heard them talk about things like uh, how there are no borders. Certainly, that's true. I, oftentimes, I feel like an idiot, like this is a brand new planet I just arrived to because I don't know where I am. I have no idea what I'm looking at. And then you get to know the Earth really well, and it becomes uh, much more like your quote unquote Mother Earth. You look down, you see gray granite, and you go, I'm over Canada. You see red soil, hey, there's Australia. And you get to know your Earth extremely well, uh, particularly the, the coastlines, which are very distinctive. You get to understand in general that uh, how, how close we are as a species. I would fly over the US and then suddenly be over the Middle East 40, 45 minutes later. Uh, I was flying over Syria during some of the uh, problems there and just understanding how close we are and yet there's there's all these big problems so you get the idea that the human race is uh, kind of in its uh, teenage years <laughs> if you were to compare it to an adult uh, early teens or something or, or maybe even as a toddler as we try to figure out how to work together uh, the biggest impact though is the earth uh, does the earth that we know 
does seem to be incredibly fragile because it's just this little tiny slip of at atmosphere, just a dusting of green that are all the, the lush forests we have, mountain ranges that uh, you can't even see the mountains actually in relief at all. Uh, you can only see their patterns. So everything we've, we've ever known as humans is incredibly fragile and therefore we are much more fragile because we're just holding on to the very obvious places where there's water, where there's some population density uh, that's very hard to see in the internal parts of continents, but most of the earth is uninhabited, not to mention the oceans. Usually you look out the window and you see blue and you realize how little of the earth we, we cover. So the fragility and the preciousness of, of both, <clears throat> both the, uh, the skin of the earth, our, our environment and of human nature in general uh, really hit you over the head. And I, I fell in love with the earth again after being up there. Great, wonderful. Well, I'd like to thank you so much. Um, we are here at 11 o'clock. Um, this was very insightful for us all. We had lots of great questions. I still see a couple more here in my little message feed that we didn't get okay. to. Um, but if you have anything else you'd like to say, um, you know, please do. And we certainly do appreciate you taking the time to to join us today and yeah, I to just, talk to Davidson. Thank you very much. I, I just had the opportunity. My, my daughter's 17 and and she kind of felt feels like I think as a lot of us do that this last uh, five weeks now and, and ensuing weeks are, are almost like blank blank pages that we might as well just rip out of our lives and, and don't mean anything, uh, which is uh, very unfortunate, at least it could be. A lot of tragedies happen to people, uh, loss of family members, loss of their income, uh, seeing the effects of the economy and I think from a from a NASA perspective, seeing uh, the way people work at NASA, one of the things we view it as as a, an opportunity. Good is not going to come out of this unless we make it. And so, I just wanted to tell you. And again, this is me talking to myself back in college, um, and what I wish I had known at the time that really the good is is what you make of this time. And you have an incredible opportunity now because the earth or our society is a bit of a blank slate now coming out of this. Nobody knows what's going to happen. So whatever you envision the way you want society to be when this is done, you have an incredible opportunity to make it so because there's a big vacuum and you're going to fill it. And I'm very excited about that. Thank you all very much for letting me talk. Yes, thank you. And I'm sure that was certainly encouraging to a lot of our students. Um, so I know everyone is muted except for the two of us, um, but we'll give you a big round of silent applause. I'm right. sure you won't Thanks be hearing much. anything, thank you all um, but we certainly do appreciate it. And we thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Kristen, Thanks, for uh, emceeing it all. I appreciate it.